Okay, hello everybody. Uh, um, I am, let's start with the uh, presentation of the, of the conference. I am beyond honored uh, to welcome Paul Julian Smith back home to the institution where he, where he taught for almost 20 years and where he made a critical impact on so many students and colleagues and uh, critically contributed to making Cambridge one of the world epicenters of his uh, Mentioning the extraordinary number of uh, publications, awards, and merits of uh, this internationally recognized critic in Hispanic cultural studies and critical theory would not do justice to how influential Paul's work has been to many of us. Elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2008, his interests are wide-ranging and interdisciplinary. And, it can, and that can be seen in his prolific career. He is the author, if I am not miscounting, of 25 books, and so far, I'm counting, and over 100 academic articles, many of which are considered groundbreaking works. Um, some of his latest books are Queer Mexico, Cinema and Television since 2000, published in 2017, Spanish and Latin America in Television Drama, Genre and Form of Translation, Multiplatform Media in Mexico, Growth and Change since 2010, Mexican Gender, Mexican Genres, Cinema, Television, and Streaming since 2010, published in 2021. Many of you will know of his enormous contributions in the study of visual culture in the Hispanic world. As the Spanish film critic for the British Film Institute, uh, Institute Science and Magazine, Smith wrote dozens of reviews, and as the author of Desire Unlimited, the Cinema of Pedro Moldova, which is a critical, critical work that has been published with different editions, uh, earned a reputation as the major world scholar on the films by the Spanish director. Smith went beyond the field of cinema in contemporary Spanish culture, TV, fashion, art, and film in 2003 uh, to examine cultural areas that received less academic attention. His 2007 work, Spanish Visual Culture, Cinema, Television, Internet, from explores emotion, location, location, and nostalgia in each of these media. And in Reimagining History in Contemporary Spanish Media, one of his most recent works published in 2021, he addresses through internationally successful TV shows such as Veneno, Vis a Vis, or La Casa de Papel, how visual culture reimagines history for the contemporary Spanish media audiences. Personally, I am proud to call Paul a friend and a mentor. One of my first memories as an undergraduate student was picking up a copy of his groundbreaking monograph, Laws of Desire, Questions of Homosexuality in Spanish Writing and Film, 1960 to 1990, which has been shown uh, just in the, previous, in the previous panel. It had just been published in its uh, Spanish translation at the time, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, in 1998, which when I started uh, my undergraduate uh, career. At that time, having just turned 18, and coming from a small town and a turbulent past, so to speak, I did not even know that queer cultural analysis was an epistemological possibility. And reading Paul's work felt like opening the door of a world that I had never imagined before. Through his guidance, I read On Way to Solo and Step to Sketch for the first time. I discovered the films of Enrique de Iglesia and even a side of Almodovar cinema of which I was unaware. Paul also introduced me to the existence of scholars that have discussed non-normative desires and gender identities. The, through Laws of Desire, I heard, I heard for the first time about Jonathan Dolmore and Eve kosowski Cedric, about Judith Butler and David Halperin. Uh, I read Paul's sharp analysis of Spanish cultural pieces as eagerly as I would a mystery novel, believing that he, what he did was something I wanted to do. I wanted to inspire people in the future the way he inspired me. Many years later, I got to meet Paul after one of the many brilliant lectures he has delivered throughout his career, that time at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. I was at that time working at the Teatro Nacional de Catalunya, yet considering returning to academia. That day, Paul and I started a personal and intellectual conversation that had lasted, thankfully, until today. And hopefully we go on. It is for these reasons 
that I am particularly proud that Paul currently distinguished professor in the Comparative Literature Program at the Graduate Center in the City University of New York is our first keynote speaker at the Queer Hispanisms Now Conference. Welcome back to Cambridge, Paul. Welcome back home. The floor is yours. Thanks so much for that lovely in, in, uh, introduction. Can you hear me like this? Yeah. My voice is a bit uh, rough. I'm hoping it's sexy, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just for flight. But um, I will attempt to be sexy for a <laughs> no, um, So it's a uh, thank you to both all of the organizers for this wonderful event. And it's so moving, really. I, I may be crying later. Um, moving to be. Uh, to be back home, as you said, said, and to see so many old friends and also new friends, I think. Um, so I'm uh, delighted by uh, the invitation. I've really had such a beautiful introduction. Thank you. So I have no moving uh, pictures. I'm the only moving thing. <laughs> <laughs> I also realize I have no, no printed words. They're just images. Jeffrey, I didn't see you. It's so fantastic that Jeffrey is here, uh, that you're all here. Okay, let's, let's get started. Let me just make sure. Yeah, there's so. So you may not know this film, you, you probably know the next one. The first section is called From Mexico to Madrid. It's Saturday morning and I'm sitting in, on the bed in my hotel room in Mexico City. Picture it. <laughs> it's a beautiful picture. <laughs> um, this is the time slot where Televisa, still the dominant broadcaster, shows an old movie typically featuring one of the local child stars of the 1970s or 80s. This time, it's different. I watch a scene where a modest Mexican nun visits a sexy Spanish showgirl in her dressing room, reflected in a mirror framed by light bulbs typical of that child's location. The odd couple engage in an, an ambivalent dialogue, which reveals an unlikely and intimate affinity. I am struck by the similarity of this unknown film to another with which I am much more familiar. This film. <laughs> Inspired by two chance encounters, the nun with the showgirl, me with the film, this lecture offers close readings of four apparently diverse audiovisual works in feature film and limited series. It argues that when subjected to the kind of meticulous and patient examination recommended by Foucault, they could be read as a kind of palimpsest in which ghostly traces of the queer are glimpsed over some five decades. <coughs> My corpus has two examples each of two genres, urban comedy, which you see behind me, and rural tragedy. The film I stumbled over in my hotel is Mariano Torres' popular farce, which is known in Mexico as Sor Metiche, <laughs> and in Spain as, bless you, U Unos Granujas Decentes. <laughs> so I have to confess, I didn't know the meaning of either of those words. Which I should, you must watch more TV and you'll learn Spanish, because I'm learning Spanish. So. Uh, Sormetiche uh, is itself a remake of his own Una Monja y un Don Juan, 1973. He anticipates surprisingly closely Amadova's black comedy come melodrama Entre Tinieblas of 1983. In its premise of an economically failing convent and its juxtaposition of a sister and a showgirl. Meanwhile, Mario Camus' prestige literary adaptation, Los Santos Inocentes, 1984, located in an, I'm not sure if I have a picture here, let me, no, I don't, more sort of a teacher. Uh, Mario Camus' Los Santos Inocentes, 1984, located in an upper class Frankist household whose pursuit of hunting is evidently emblematic is reframed by Mexican director, Mexican gay director, Manolo Caro, as the more explicit Netflix original, 
alguien tiene que morir from 2020. So this three-part series is set in a similarly toxic family in the brutal early Franquist period shot in Spain by a Mexican director. That's why the talk, oh, I didn't know, so the name of the talk was, the talk is called Mexicans in Madrid, Authorities and Amadora, Camus and Caro. Despite their different tones and, and genres, the texts of my four work works depict the same socio-political issues of religion, repression, and sexuality. And their production and reception raise four general questions of respectively popular culture, auteurism, the middle brow, and screen fiction in an age of digital distribution. Moreover, the theme of the Mexican visitor to Spain central to the first and last of my texts, mm -hmm. raises the further vital question of the transnational. So how do I deal with this? Seeking to go beyond naive genetic criticism or empirical cultural history, this chapter, chapter, mm -hmm. I give myself a word, this <laughs> lecture, <laughs> you could just read the book. <laughs> I go, I'll go for another walk and I just got lost outside, but I made it back. Uh, Cambridge is changing all the time. This is what they don't know about Cambridge. It's very modern. No, it is. It just keeps changing and updating. Uh, this chapter dialogues with Foucault's well-known essay, Nietzsche, Genealogy, History of 1971, and his less familiar fragmentary writings on film, compiled in 2011 as Foucault va au cinéma, which I think is now in English also. In the latter, mainly interviews with the critics of Cahiers du Cinéma, Foucault responds to a cycle of fiction films of the mid-70s, often queer themes like Salo, Pasolini, 1974, and The Night Porter, Cavani, also 1974. In his view, these period films falsely eroticize fascism and Nazism. And he comments more positively on two rural tragedies, films, which reveal rather the desire for power by young men. The austere cinematic adaptation of a real-life rural tragedy whose genealogy he himself had documented, that of the multiple murderer in Moi, Pierre, Rivière by René Alliot in 1976, and the fiction feature on an accidental adherent to the Gestapo in occupied France, Louis Mal's La Combe Lucien in 1974. So following Foucault, and in the published version, there's a lot more reference to Foucault, which will make it clearer. Uh, this lecture, lecture, I got it right there. This lecture <laughs> will argue for a genealogy. There's been so many talks on archive and genealogy, so I hope I'm contributing to that communal project a genealogy which is intimately attached to the body, and most especially to the ingestion of food, and for a historical cinema, and a history of cinema, that is in Foucault's phrase again, anti-retro, avoiding the facile consolations of nostalgia and self-recognition in the past. Okay, that's just the introduction. I'm going to have to read much faster <laughs> to get through this. <laughs> we'll see how we go. Uh, so the second section is called Authorities and its Origin, and these are terms that Foucault takes from Nietzsche in the original German. Mariano Authorities, Frank Wisson's prolific director of some 99 comedies. Why did he stop at 99? <laughs> 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 because Spanish cinema changed and he could no longer get funding, that's why. Uh, is known for a coarse costumbrismo that now feels marooned in the distant past. In sort of metiche, the still timid social and sexual transformations of the transition, we had the proto destape no? This is kind of proto destape are embodied here in the figure of Barbara, Barbara Rey, known as the queen of the destape, and as a waitress working in a topless bar who is also a gangster's mole. It, it can happen. <laughs> uh, there is a clear, perhaps, proto-lesbian complicity now between the feisty nun and the newly proactive showgirl, 
the showgirl proclaims she is not no longer a mujer objeto because now women have the same rights as men. And as a proud feminist, she supports Sor Metiche by force, this is rather complicated, forcing the criminal gang led by her lover to return the hall they have stolen from the impoverished convent. If you just think of Enfield de Nieves, she would more or less follow the plot. So the bankrupt nuns are, the, are saved from the clutches of a bumbling count in Enfield de Nieves as a marquesa. Uh, and his crafty assistant, assistant, who is actually named Almodovar in the film. <laughs> the vill villainous pair has sought to evict the nuns and make a profit speculating with their Madrid property. A further palimpsest here is the trace of perception in the twin countries of this rare co-production. Uh, so I'll try to say a little about production and reception as I go. So Medici was funded by Televisa's feature film division, Televisine, Unlike in the original nat National Catholic version where the nun never sings, a key attraction in the transnational remake is music. Here is Sor Medici arriving at Baracas. Here is, you may mention Lina, remember Lina Morgan, who's in the original version and who does not sing. And here we, we see uh, the Mexican actress Maria Victoria singing. She's known as a singer. And this scene is very similar to the scene at the end of Entre Thinemus where Yolanda sings against a, a sparkly black draw, backdrop. Now, the other smiling Maria Victoria, I think probably unknown in Spain, had long been a major com comedian and singing star in Mexico. No, uh, this is something else, but this is the showing the co-production. Here you see her singing. It looks like standard music, doesn't it? <laughs> But this is what Maria Victoria looks like in Mexico. It's kind of different to how she looked when she went to Spain. Um, she was known for essential versions of local genres such as bolero and ranchera. Here she is given three set piece numbers of somewhat saccharine Christian pop. So it must have come as a shock to Mexican audiences if they saw this film and Televisine films were uh, popular uh, to see her hourglass figure normally display, displayed in strapless Eurex gowns, hidden by the modest nun's ha habit. National stereotype cuts both ways in Sor Metiche. Maria Victoria, only just arrived at Baracas, is treated to a motorized <coughs> guided tour of the capital's <coughs> tourist sites, uh, as you can see here. Here they are. Uh, this credit sequence is no doubt intended for Mexican audiences who enjoy, enjoy its postcard shots of a foreign capital. Meanwhile, in the coarsest comedy sequence of the film, Sor Metiche adds just a little chile to the system's all rice diet. This causes predictable gastric havoc in, in the sheltered nun's digestive system. But the point is, this kind of group dining scene is very similar to uh, Amadova, but they suggest the bodily connection between digestion, identity, and community at a time when Chile was probably not so well known in Madrid as it is today. So, beyond the grand narrative of social and sexual change, which is glimpsed here, a showgirl suddenly sure of her rights as an outspoken feminist, the transnational comedy attaches itself like Foucault's genealogy, to the little story of the body, to its multiple functions and trials. So one odd sequence survives in both versions of the film. It is of an old man who re resists a medical injection in the buttocks from the nun, uh, and, uh, it, uh, because he claims to fear maricones as he bends over the kitchen table. So this is kind of very coarse humor, of course. Uh, but it is perhaps surprising that a film like this with, sorry, unsurprising that a film like this with two titles and two production companies, <coughs> two nations, should, like Foucault's model of genealogy, derive from dissenting sources. Mm. And if Foucault's main aim is to parody the pious religious film that stretches back at least to Marcelino Panivino in 1955, of which more later. He and his faithful audience can now afford to laugh at such solemn origins. So this stands for me as origin. <laughs> this is 
the Spanish mm -hmm. title. Uh, the genealogy of film comedy is not, of course, to be taken as unproblematic documentary evidence for political transition or socio-cultural socio change. But the archives of Francoist and post-Francoist comedy have here become tangled reels of celluloid, erased and overwritten. These are all quotes from Foucault in the short space of time between the two versions of the same unlikely story. And the Mexican characters in Authorius's auto remake, religious and criminal, indigestible and unpronounceable, are the sign of a new emergent subject which we might call queer. They don't quite fit in in Madrid. So, uh, Arboa as descent, <coughs> descent. So what I've argued then is that origin is problem problematized in Authorisis Sormetice, which is a part Mexican remake from the transition that is in constant silent dialogue with its Fra Francoist predecessor, the film starring Lena Morgan, which is not Mexican. In Amadores Entre Tinieblas, so is descent problematized. Foucault defines descent as, quote, the accidents, the minute deviations, or conversely, the complete reversals, the errors, the first false appraisals, and the faulty calculations that gave birth to those things that continue to exist and have value for us." End quote. So it's rather <coughs> moving, I find that phrase. He continues in a felicitous nod to our religious context. Of course, this piece is a general theoretical piece. He says, this is undoubtedly why every origin of morality, from the moment it stops being pious, and Herkunft, descent, can never be pious, has value as a critique. So you see how this might relate to Entre Tinieblas, the convent comedy. Now, in early interviews, Amadova cites a family resemblance between Entre Tinieblas and the Hollywood melodrama of Douglas Sirk. I myself once claimed, actually in my inaugural lecture in the University of Cambridge, a common ancestry for Amadova's convent melodrama in the secular world of cloistered women in Lorca's La Casa de Bernada Alba. Here I'll argue rather for the film's close connection with the low-brow Iberian sex comedies, such as those of authorities. The accident that gave birth to Sor Metiche, Foucault talks about accidents in this process of descent, um, was rare co-funding with Mexican behemoth Televisa. I don't, I'm not aware of any other co-production from Televisa coming to Spain. The faulty calculation that just stated Entre Tinieblas was the Amadolas bro uh, brothers' collaboration with the now forgotten production house Tesauro. This is before they had El Deseo. Uh, uh, Tesauro's boss insisted on his wife, Cristina Sánchez Pascual, being cast as the central chanteuse, which I believe in America is pronounced chanteuse, which is fine. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you may remember there's a central, uh, this is the Marquesa, we will come back to her, <laughs> Marica Radio. I would always claim that the deficiencies in Sánchez's performance style led to a shift in narrative focus during the shoot. The relatively act and act affectless showgirl was meant to be the star. I'll show a picture of her in a minute. To the intensely amorous lesbian mother superior, played by the wonderful Julieta Serrano. So this is my little bit of archival work. When I had the opportunity to consult two faded versions of the unpublished script in the archives of El Deseo in Madrid, uh, script versions of uh, in the evidence. And at that point, Amadou would write, they were like little novels, and they would tell you about the uh, things that would not be a script, <laughs> like the, the motivations of the character, what the characters were thinking, what they did yesterday, what they had for breakfast. It was very curious as a genre. Um, anyway, when I had the opportunity to consult these faded versions, thank you, El Deseo, I would confirm, could confirm how farcical elements in the film were progressively eliminated from the plot in line with this revision 
or diversion of attention from the singer to the mother superior. I also write closest to the time of Entre Tinieblas' release and critics' refusal to recognize the seriousness of. Sorry, this is. Uh, no, this is serious, is it not? Uh, the seriousness uh, of the lesbian love as portrayed by the gravely moving Serrano. And of course, she collaborated with Amadora for 30 more years. The marginalization of men and the excision of heterosexuality is clearly confirmed at the very start in that dressing room sequence I mentioned, in a sequence whose location uh, is uh, reminiscent of a chapel. The mother superior professes her fandom for Chantez Jolanda as the couple are reflected and haloed in the illuminated mirror. Asked for a signed photo, Yolanda, the singer, using a pair of scissors, literally cuts out of the picture her boyfriend. And there is no equivalent in Entre Tinieblas of the bumbling band of male criminals in Sormetice to distract from the, the convent's all-female community. Despite the differences in genre and tone, the similarities between Alcoris and Amadova are self-evident. Uh, so I'll skip some of this but where authorities has a vain and incompetent count attempt to evict the, the sisters Amalova invents rather an extravagantly garbed marchioness Marquesa as grandly play played by veteran Mari Carrillo she trails with her memories from Franco's films which were still recent to audiences in 1983 there's also a tiger. Uh, the tiger is the clearest example of crazy comedy of incongruity and non sequitur that Amadova, I would argue, inherits from authorities. However, so my teacher's blander, cleaner looking convent reads as less local and physical than Epitinievus's crumbling location in Troika, whose ruinous aspect marks Catholic culture's decadent descent in a new secular Spain. Conversely, the tiger, being fed here, of course, by Carmen Maura, uh, is a sign of an exotic element that resists any simple assimilation to Spanish cartography or genealogy. The nuns take for granted there is a tiger <laughs> in their patio. Beyond locations, and as in Storme Tice, once more, the nuns' reversal of fortune is vehicled mainly through song. Latin American song. Like Sor Metice, Yolanda and the Mother Superior are granted full scale musical numbers. In the first, they sing to each other a bolero hymn to masochistic jouissance. You remember this? Uh, Encadenados. In the second, which is reminiscent of Sor Metice's uh, prize winning performance, which I showed you before, on a sequined set, so all these details match up. Yolanda lip syncs in a glittery gown to the entranced Mother Superior, the song whose lyric announces, anticipates her flight from the convent. In the film's very last shot, to the accompaniment of, of the bolero once more, the camera pulls back to show the anguished and abandoned Mother Superior through an open window, which is framed by shadows of tropical palm, palm trees, hardly typical. Madrid. So, returning in its music, I'm finishing on this film, music and mise en scène to a Latin American subtext which goes unspoken in the script. Entre Tinieblas also demonstrates how the scent attaches itself to the body. Both female protagonists share a fragile nervous system, an intemperate temperament, and disrupted digestive apparatus. There's a lot of vomiting in this film. Uh, later, uh, the debilitated body of uh, Amadova's mother superior is displayed martyr-like in a sequence of withdrawal. Here is elsewhere ominous high angles. I should do a picture in the previous film of a high angle over the Plata de España. I look down on the erring nuns, the sign perhaps of a discontinuous descent from ancestors in whose era the experience of martyrdom still had transcendent meaning. Finally then, 
Amalur follows Foucault's version of dissent in revealing that the origin of morality is not or is no longer pious. His convent comedy is full of false appraisals and faulty calculations. These are little quotes from Foucault. But Amadova, the new auteur of the transition, also shows how a mise en scène can be a place of confrontation. That is, in Foucault's phrase again, a field of entangled and confused parchments. Even as he testifies, Alex is like to traces of the most repressive of social and cinematic antecedents. Still, Entre Tinieblas is a thing that can have value to us as an emergent example of queer critique. As I say, I love this film. I will never stop writing <laughs> about this film after 20 years. So let's move on to something. Well, here I have a story. My first job, there, uh, look, the first supper in the convent. <laughs> Great scene, and you may not recognize this because it's the landscape of Los Santos in North Bend. It's Mario Camus, a tiny anecdote. My first job when I left uh, Cambridge, my PhD, very proud. My first job was in the University of London, Queen Mary College, also very proud. And I took students to see this film. This film was made one year after <coughs> Entre the Nieras, 1984. And they watched this film and they said, Never take us to a Spanish film. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is before the Amadova films were showing in London. So I thought, well, perhaps this kind of filmmaking doesn't connect with a youth demographic. That was what I, the lesson I learned. Also, I thought, I gave up my evening. <laughs> I've already seen this film. I didn't really want to see it again. And you are, you are ungrateful students. I'm sure you've had experiences like that. Uh, but I learned something from it. And of course then, it was very sad that Mario Camus died, I think, last year. And uh, Bailly said he was the most sober of Spanish filmmakers. Sobrio. And I thought, oh, you know, this is the best you could say. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't drunk. <laughs> Then came out over and suddenly sobriety was no longer a virtue. No. No. And I think for my trendy London students in 1984, you know, sobriety was not, <laughs> not their thing either. Conversely, a new kind of cinema emerging at that time in the early 80s with the socialist government. I'm delighted so many papers about the 70s and about the transition that this tap here. So Camus as emergence, something new was happening here with these films, which were very popular with Spanish audiences, if not London audiences. So we're halfway through the lecture. We're going down, it'll be more fun later, I hope. We move now in the second half of this lecture to a pair of screen fictions that do not evoke the past, but rather seek to recreate it. And we shift in focus from the city to the countryside. In both works, bleak landscape shots, you can see here, of an apparently immemorial setting will be briefly convulsed by deadly violence. Mario Camus' Los Santos in Atlantis, made just one year after Entre Tinieblas, but is it like, coming from a different planet? You know, how could they have been in the same country at the same time, these two directors? So it might be compared to the rural tragedies of a decade earlier, the 70s, that attracted Foucault to the cinema, Pierre Rivière and La Combusien. Pierre Rivière is on YouTube. Uh, Foucault calls attention, in the case of Rivière, to the still recent literacy of the parents and the precarious, what he calls, prise de parole, uh, they were granted by an exceptional circumstance, namely a mass murder in their little village. And in Los Santos Inocentes, there are also scenes of the characters laboriously learning to read and write. The Camus peasants remain taciturn. Los Santos in Offense is a key text, as you know, in the emergence of a new corpus of fiction films after the funding changes of the so-called Miro Law. The film partakes of the social realism scorned by Amadova, but it also testifies, that, despite itself, to a Spanish cinema whose development was lacking in continuity. At the moment that it appeared, 1984, uh, 
how hugely popular genres, such as authorities' sex comedy, <coughs> suddenly disappeared because funding was relocated to quality, so-called quality. Actually, digno is another word that's used a lot about Mario Camus. Sobrio. Digno. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and yet, there are films which have great value as the emergence of a de democratic cinem cinema, no? Um, as is well known, the more dignified quality cinema, cinema of the socialist era, fit for a new democracy, often featured literary adaptations of period pictures like this, with impeccably progressive politics and an unimpeachable mise en scène. <coughs> if such films serve a didactic function as a quick cut to cultural capital, you don't have to read the Delibus novel, you can just watch the film. There is no doubt they still attract a massively popular audience. Los Santos in Ofendis had two million admissions, imagine. In Tres had only 400,000. Of course, El País, which had been attacking Eloy de la Iglesia for 10 years, virulently attacked Almodovar all through this period, and indeed now. No. Yeah. Yeah. Almodovar's gay cowboy firm in Venice is destroyed in El País. The reliable and pro prolific uh, Camus acted in television as well as in feature film in so-called series classicas, an important phrase, worked through the national past with a safe pair of hands. The casting of Los Santos in Offensives reproduces these tensions in the family shot. You may recognize this actor. Alfredo Landa, a cherished and, and despised comedy veteran for directors such as Authorities, shared the Best Actor Award at Cannes for this film with Francisco Raval, who was already consecrated by his work for Buñuel in both Mexico and Spain. Mari Carrillo, Carrillo meanwhile, repeats her role as Marquesa from Entre Tinieblas. So I was very excited to see this connection, <laughs> albeit in a more sober key. So here you see her <laughs> as another Marquesa. Here she's waving from the balcony in Los Santos Inocentes. <laughs> <laughs> so here she's waving from a balcony in Entre Tinieblas. <laughs> so tell me, which film would you rather see? <laughs> <laughs> the makeup. Of course, the Marquesa says also, she says proudly, I am an esthetician. <laughs> <laughs> she does her own makeup. She does the Mother Superior's makeup. But unfortunately, she, she cannot win. The Mother Spirit does not win the love for Yolanda. I think Yolanda is such a fool. Why does she run away? Um, so relevant here is Foucault on the anti-retro. That is, we should not recognize ourselves in the past. In Los Santos Inofentes, fascism is hardly eroticized. It can rarely have seemed less fascinating. This is sadistic and uh, well, they're having some kind of peasant dinner. So that's not relevant. But the sadistic senorito played by Juan Diego is repellent. And he is uh, a character who uses repeatedly and brutally the slow maricón. Foucault's eroticized desire for power is nowhere, nowhere seen here. Uh, you remember Pierre Riviere is a book by Foucault, but also uh, a film in the 70s. Pierre Riviere's matricide is finally inexplicable. Indeed, what attracts Foucault to this young murderer is the fact that his unusually eloquent confession cannot be accounted for by the new discourses of psychology and criminology. And it's truly scary if you, you can read the original online if you know French. So the spelling isn't so great, but then he was a peasant who had just learned to write so he could tell the story of why he killed his mother. Uh, and you may remember at the end of this film, so I want to show these are dining scenes which will be recreated by the Mexican Manolo Caro in my next show. And so I want you to think about gastronomy and digestion and throwing up. Um, this is Alfredo Landa, this is the Senorito, this is the very cute son who I think never acted again. I would see films with him in it. <laughs> yeah, you, and that's something else. Uh, so, no longer the final term of, of a historical development, that is, a cinema fit for democracy. Finally, the Spaniards 
and he went, you know, with, in all seriousness, a cinema that was made to coincide with the new democracy, uh, which was digno, much less in uninterrupted continuity. The emergence of Camus's middle brow cinema, and he always said Sally, Sally Faulkner, who has written a great deal on the middle brow in Spanish cinema, suggests a spectacle of struggle inside the film, outside the film. It is a process that points mutually to the paradoxes of Foucault's real or efficient history to which we now turn. And this is the last section I promise. But I hope it will be more fun. Has anyone seen this Netflix series? Yes. Ah, right. So, Manolo Caro. Last week I gave a, a lecture in a con conference in Mexico City precisely on this full pride on queer film. And they said, we want you to speak about Manolo Caro. And they said, you want to give me a week? What do I, I need longer than a week, so I'm uh, afraid I cannibalize this. And, and I got Google to translate it for me. But Manuel Caro is a very important figure uh, in, in Mexico and indeed in Netflix more globally. So Caro has effective history. Mexican Manuel Caro's Netflix original, Alguien Tiene Que Morir, a miniseries in three hour long episodes, rewrites pal palimpsis like a privileged genre of Spanish cinema. That is the period rural tragedy. And its premise would have been familiar to Spanish film audiences of the 1980s. A repressive Francoist family, who you see here, devoted to hunting, <coughs> sacrifices its most vulnerable members. Given Caro's earlier works, the genre, tone, and setting would come as something of a surprise. Originally famous in Mexico for feature film romantic comedies, actually sometimes with a trans, uh, a trans twist, if you like. Caro became best known abroad for La Casa de las Flores, which you probably have seen, which did not look very much like this. Uh, La Casa de las Flores, 2018 to 20, a Mexico City set comedy melodrama in a campy style reminiscent of early Almodovar. The three seasons of this limited series, La Casa de las Flores, which latterly included actors and locations from Spain, drew on Mexican audiences' memories of telenovela were replayed by a cavalcade of queer characters, gay, bi, and trans. Unlike the discreet Almodovar, always nervous of identitarian or political labels, I think it was Alberto first made in Spain, people don't like etiquetas. No me gustan las etiquetas. I think Almodovar has been saying that for 40 years. Um, <laughs> but to his credit, Manolo Caro, uh, uh, his uh, cast and crew, have also been prominent participants in Mexico City's real life Pride Parade. I think Alador has ever been in Pride, has he? No. Well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, in Argentina, Nicky Morir, the younger actor's backstories, you remember know this guy from a Spanish uh, or other Catalan series? So he's the repressed boyfriend. No. With and without Caro, add another level to the media palimpsest. So Catalans would recognize this actor for playing a gay role. Mm -hmm. This is the famous uh, Mexican actress, Cecilia Suarez, known as the muse of uh, Caro, just as Carmen Mauro at one period was the muse of Almodovar in her Jaula de Oro. And this is the very cute Alejandro Spitzer, who for me is the star. He, wherever he appears, he's the star. Protagonist uh, El Alejandro Spitzer as Gabino, so a Mexican actor, he's, he's a gay son reluctantly returning to Spain from Mexico after a 10 year exile. And we don't know when it is, it's probably in the late 40s. Um, he, he, Spitzer, had established his adult name in Mexican regionalist romantic comedy with as a great film called Me Gusta, Pero Me Asusta. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a comedy you should see, a regionalist comedy, 2017. I saw it just after an earthquake, and it was really what I needed to, to get my uh, spirits up. And in limited series, also from Netflix, with a strongly erotic component. So if you want to see him naked, you should look at El Club on Netflix 2019, and also Oscuro Deseo, it's a kind of would-be film noir, 2020-22. 
It also starred in the same year as Argentinique et Morir in Straight. This is, I think, a rather different American play, which kept its same English title in, in Mexico. It's a gay-themed play of sort of coming out, of hesitating between, oh, I have a boyfriend and a girlfriend, what will I do? Sort of 90 minutes later. <laughs> I, I have wasted my evening when I got to see Alejandro's fights in real life. So, probably not so wasted. So he played this, it was directed by Manuel Carrer himself because he came out of theatre at the Teatro Milan, a lovely little theatre in Mexico City's gay village, the Zona Rosa. So that was a pleasant evening and a bad play. But it was important that it was a gay play that kept its English name and what was that? I'm not sure what that means. So, the casting Carmen Maura, always always wonderful in anything that she does. And she has, of course, a career in France, a career in Mexico. She has many careers. Who works harder than Carmen Maura? So, casting of Carmen Maura as the deadly matriarch and Paro. I believe consecrated Caro, the director no, and creator, no longer a mere Mexican falseur, bromista, as a cineast worthy of prestige in the highest ranks of Spanish tradition. The high profile presence of Maura here would evoke her unparalleled career of some 160 credits from the dictatorship to the present, including, of course, her celebrated features from the in the 1980s, including Entre Tinieblas. So it's the wider production context also suggests, and I do have some, I have never met Caro, but I've met other TV producers in Mexico, so I'm going by what they tell me about uh, pitching um, executives in, in, in Netflix. Uh, it's a kind of emergence or apparition here. It feels both familiar and novel in a new digital medium. On the one hand, Argentina Gamoril confirms recent scholarship on Mexican streaming. This has shown that Netflix appeals to the cultural closeness or proximity of the local audience <coughs> via the heritage genre of telenovela in original shows that serve as an affectionate parody of telenovela, La Casa de las Flores. On the other hand, Spanish series, that series made in Spain for Netflix, drew on their country's competitive advantage in female based and targeted costume drama. Las Chicas del Cable, for example, which was a huge hit in America, as far as we can tell, because of course Netflix doesn't give figures. Um, the Mexican Caro makes and remakes Spanish cinema with Argentinique Morir. He does so by re-engaging the historicist mode of the transition film and thereby reframing the critical questions of popular culture, auteurism, and the middle ground. Now, when it comes to thematics, uh, Cairo's limited series is the most explicit of my four texts on the social issues of religion, state repression, and sexuality, and the structural relation between the three. So within the story, Maura's son, is high up in the security service where he oversees the torture of gay men. So these are very distressing sequences. This is the dancer. Later I have a picture of the torture, but maybe I shouldn't even show that. Uh, Maura's son is high up in the security service where he oversees the torture of gay men in the bowels of a sinister headquarters. The fatal strategy of hunting is ominously reinforced in the art design by the profusion of skulls and antlers affixed to the walls of the unhappy home. So this is a toxic Francoist family, from, familiar from Spanish film in the 80s. It's disrupted by not one, but two exotic visitors from Mexico. So we've seen Spice's troubled gay Gabino, who is in theory a Spaniard, who has, after a decade abroad, gone native, thus explaining the actor's Mexican accent. And, but the exotic companion he brings with him is a free-thinking ballet dancer, played by Isaac Hernandez, who you see here, who is in real life the Cuban-British star of London's Royal Valley. So there is a clear contrast between homophobia and xenophobia. 
As soon as the two boys arrive in Spain, they are subject to malicious rumours at the elite club. This is all outside Madrid in, in the countryside. And it's shown that to have a son who is said to be a maricón brings social and professional disgrace to the whole family. Conversely, Maura's, Maura's matriarch is, in the final episode, learned to set his public speech. It's like she has a little stage here at the hunting club. Her enduring loyalty to hunting is inseparable from her adherence to political and social norms. Oh, this is the torture, you don't want to see this. And these are the very formal dinners. Uh, so you see, the, the, all of these uh, films and TV series have important dinner scenes, which is quite difficult to shoot, actually. Uh, Spanish film historians will note here the echoes of the rural tragedies of the transition, not just of Santos in Offensive, but also Fortivos. Because in Fortivos, Borao, 1975, the fear of Franco was displaced onto a murderous matriarch. Oh, you don't want to see that, do you? <laughs> is this the, uh, the house? It's like a, a Castilian castle. Okay, so it seems I don't have a picture from Fortivos. Uh, hmm. So in Fortivos, a very famous film of the transition, uh, the fear of Franco was displaced onto a murderous matriarch. Uh, that despite, despite the nostalgic wardrobe and expert art design, Caro is anti-retro. The dull greens, uh, greys and browns of the sets echo Los Santos, Inocentes and its ilk. Uh, but they distance Caro and his audience from the creator's vibrantly coloured contemporary content made in and on Mexico. Like I said, Flores is kind of fluorescent colours. <coughs> Florals, indeed. Following Foucault's effective history, Alguien Tiene Que Morir, relatively sober and aesthetic, reads in its current context of production and reception, almost like parody, directly against the goal of the reproduction of the real that we saw in Los Santos Inocentes, more modest naturalism. So that there can be no simple self-recognition in the past here. So it doesn't give us what we might like as gay spectators, you know, because uh, spoiler, the, uh, the boy dancer is straight. Um, most extended and distressing. So maybe I did show that. I did show that. Uh, torture scene in the series is where a captive gay man is forced to swallow cockroaches. Elsewhere in the series, rituals of food are in my, as in my earlier works, emblematic. For example, Maura's Spanish matriarch reprimands her Mexican daughter-in-law when the latter stoops to pick up a fork dropped by a servant at a dinner as formal as any in Los Santos Inocentes. So Mex Mexico stands for freedom here, with some reason, of course. Meanwhile, sexual activity is more explicit than the earlier text, uh, but there is a brief bucolic idyll, but it is heterosexual, <coughs> between the dancer and the mother. Uh, spanning the grand narrative of the dictatorship, Caro takes up what Foucault calls the shortened vision of effective history. He focuses on those things nearest to the body, the nervous system, nutrition, digestion, and energies. Here you see, well, you see some energies going on. <laughs> Very little energy in Spain <laughs> at that time, tragic time. This, this is like El Greco, you know, look at the sky. Mm -hmm. So kind of really went Spanish in this. So the sense of there are seen ballet performances within the film, and they seem to take the place of musical numbers in my earlier, within the TV show. They take the place of the musical numbers in my earlier films, with choreography lending an energetic rhythm to the body. And there are scenes where a maximum boy teaches these straight-backed, Spanish matrons to dance, you know. Uh, Caro then sticks with surprising closeness to aspects of Camus and his cohort. We're given no dates. The main location of Alguien Tiene Que Morir is a castle-like manor house <coughs> that seems like Los Santos' inauthentic estate, hermetically isolated from the wider world. This dignified quality work 
for Netflix is then clearly descended from the tradition of Mirovian cinema, as uh, socialist cinema of the 80s, and uh, the middle brow, which also expressed itself in classic television series of the transition. So Caro offers us an impeccably progressive politics, he's anti-fascist, uh, and an unimpeachable mise-en-scene. But Argentina que Moria feels like an uncanny adaptation without a literary original, a sort of streaming simulacrum. So I thought I'd, I'd rather read the book. But there isn't a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an adaptation. But, but it's extraordinary that he would go to such care to recreate absolutely a film genre that died 40 years before. To his credit, though, Caro stages no desire for power. Like Foucault's hygienic Nazis, the word Foucault uses, Foucault's phrases and the Nazi were not sexy, and they should not be seen as sexy. Uh, Caro's unerotic Frankist bureaucrats seek only to purge the body politic of its supposed contaminants. Okay, so now a little social media to show a reception. A survey of star Alejandro Spitzer's Instagram feed at the time of the series' production and premiere confirms the series' place in the political and cultural field in this current moment, when the professional reputation of actors is tied as much to their online presence as to their acting roles. Thus, Spitzer or his social media staff post to the actors five million followers. I must uh, insist this is a really important star, this guy. Alejandro Spitzer, 5 million followers. He posts a stark message on tolerance. No hay hombre que haya nacido machista, racista, clasista, homofóbico, o violento. Or again, we read, uh, beside an image of a somber Spitzer on the rock strewn Castilian forest. No se puede vivir del pasado, pero si aprender de lo vivido. So one thing learned from the past would seem to be uh, the freedoms of non-binary gender identity afforded by the present. In one post, Spitzer on the right dances alongside Hernández, reproducing exactly his colleague's politic plea. Also, this. In another, the cover of Bad Hombre magazine, tagline, fashion for the thinking man. <laughs> So here you have a thinking man. <laughs> 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 Cambridge, can we imagine the thinking man? <laughs> this is what we see. <laughs> uh, this is what we would like to see. <laughs> Go to the university live at the UL. <laughs> see if there are any Mexican movie stars that may liven up your thesis if you're in the middle of writing your thesis. <laughs> So he poses provocatively, I write, I think you might agree, uh, in a tight pink polka dot top, grey suede opera gloves, and a chunky costume necklace. I think you would not be allowed into the formal dinner at Fitzwilliam. <laughs> 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 He'd say, You're a Mexican film star, get out with your five million followers. We don't want you here. Uh, no, I'm joking. Cambridge is very modern. And, you know, but seriously, when I was <laughs> started doing we work here 40 years ago. It's the case is not. I was at, totally supported by my colleagues and students by the institution. So I'm very extremely grateful for that. Uh, chunky costume necklace reading Moschino. Spicer does indeed appear on Instagram at this time in sober family portraits promoting his series. I don't have that, but you saw that it before. Rather like those used in the publicity for Los Santos in Authentics, they face the camera and look very glum. Mm -hmm. It's Francoism. We have to wait for <laughs> another 30 years before we can have fun. Uh, but the young star curates his role as a luxury fashion influencer, uh, most insistently as the ambassador for Bulgari watches and jewellery, which you can't see very well here, as carefully as he does his transnational acting career. And why not? So in Argentina que Moria, homophobia is of course more explicit than in the earlier films I mentioned. <coughs> What's next? Ah, so the bird as the symbol of the innocent victim of uh, Francoism 
you may remember. Milana Bonita. Mm, so. And it's now the phrase, so there is a, an emblematic bird in Los Santos in Authentis, which is killed at the end. And this is the bird in uh, uh, Argentina Camorio, also to be shot. Um, homophobia is, of course, more explicit than in my earlier films. Someone shows that one, so that one wanted Caro and his team because he lists Spanish researchers who, who, whose work he, he gets a co-writing credit that the Spanish researchers were in the archives reading to make it all authentic, supposedly. Uh, I believe he draws on recent memoirs of gay prisoners of the dictatorship. Some of you know these books. Uh, grotesque but precise details recur. For example, the father is asked, if his son should be sent to a prison for active or passive maricones. Mm -hmm. Because the two, and this was true, was it not? That they were kept in separate prisons, they had to be kept rigorously separated. So it's just these little details which are like reality effects or history effects, people call, mm -hmm. to think, wow, did that really happen? Yes, it happened. So it remains curious, however, that Caro is so explicit in his earlier works, he attends to discretion. As mentioned earlier, the Mexican boys are not lovers, and the final pastoral lovemaking is between the dancer and the frustrated wife. In the play of dominations and spectacle of struggle that Foucault identifies with emergence, homosexuals here can have no happiness. There's this little space for nostalgia <coughs> in the anti-retro of Caro's uncharacteristic period series. I don't think he's made anything like this since. Uh, just as there is none in, in Foucault's corpus of fragmentary film writings. Apparently Foucault didn't go very often to the cinema and he wrote very briefly about it. Uh, conversely, Argentini que morir cannot, I think, finally serve as documentary testimony to past horrors. Unlike Camus' recognizably feudal estate, which stands in for the Spanish state, uh, Caro's premise of Mexican visitors to a Francoist clan. Right, I'm sorry. How many Mexicans visited um, uh, Francoist, you know, Francoist fasc very fascist uh, Fernandist family outside Madrid in the 1940s? This is a very idiosyncratic premise, presumably so that it will play in Mexico as well. Uh, it's difficult that it bears the burden of Spanish national allegory. Rather, I would argue finally that Caro's drama coincides with the tropes of effective history. First, it is parodic. It denies history as recognition. Second, it is dissociative. These are all terms with which Foucault, Foucault describes effective history. Dissociative. <coughs> it opposes history as continuity or tradition. And lastly, it is sacrificial. It opposes history as knowledge. Despite Spitzer's earnest, earnest announcement on Instagram, it is not clear what modern viewers can learn from what was lived in the past. In part of these little flashes which we come through. Is this my conclusion? Can I, can I conclude? You tried to stop. Absolutely. He won't stop me. <laughs> uh, so, finally, from history to genealogy. Yeah, nobody does uh, film history anymore. Why, in Mexican film studies, history is really important, the history of Mexican film. But nobody's really seen to do that. So I'm proposing a new model, which would be genealogy. We've seen then that my chosen tags from Autores, from Camus, the Caro, are scratched over and recopied many times. And as I experienced in my Mexican hotel, perhaps broadcast TV, so neglected now, just as much as the YouTube, which currently hosts Sorme Tiche and Los Santos Inocentes, can still serve as a kind of serendipitous archive you turn on the TV, you don't know what you'll see. Unlike when you go to Netflix when you've already chosen something. So a serendipitous archive of live television, it enables connections that are most unexpected. I would never have guessed that Amadova had based Andres Nieblas on a stupid or for his comedy. And that I discovered from watching TV in my hotel room when I could have been out having fun. But no, <laughs> it was kind of almost a pandemic. I was anxious to go home and I learned something from my television set. As we have seen, religion, repression, and sexuality are constant themes that are shuffled and redealt by my creators. And popular culture, autorism, the middle brow, and digital distribution are some of the cultural controversies 
remain the most conscient. What does it mean to be an auteur on Netflix? Well, it's kind of industrial, but Caro had has a continuing contract with them, and he was the first Latin American to have that. And he says he has complete artistic freedom. He says it's a very queer platform in interviews. Mm -hmm. Foucault's terms borrowed from Nietzsche, you remember, origin, descent, emergence, effect of history in the English translation of these, they may seem obscure, I think they are obscure. And my Foucauldian genealogy of Spanish film, Mexican film, Mexican Spanish film, may seem implausible, but it reminds us as scholars we cannot freeze the movement of time, fix the present state of our field forever. The convergence of cinema and television during a pandemic is one sure sign of an unexpected emergence. Foucault's moral, simply, is that there can be no absolute origin, no definitive ending, and it remains bracing, as does his embrace of the bodily, saying what's going on here in history is the bodily. Maybe may be familiar now, but he says it in a very beautiful way. I have argued seen centering on meals in all four works trace an intimate connection between digestion, identity, and community. Now, one recent study has, uh, has baptized the cosmopolitan Hispanophone subscribers to Netflix with the suggested name of omnivores. Mm -hmm. Someone called Joseph Stropar, who was a great scholar of Latin American television. Omnivores. That is, they'll watch anything, but they will have an opinion about everything also. <laughs> Moreover, the incongruous and exceptional Mexican visitor to Spain, vital to the first and last of my texts, testifies not only to the vicissitudes of audiovisual production and reception in a transnational mode, but I've argued to an emergent queer critique. Caro's gay alien, bloody but unbowed. Most of the characters are shot dead at the end of, um, of the series. It's just the latest <coughs> reiteration of figures that embody the outside of a society that can neither be ignored nor absorbed. Authoris is Jalisco nun. I didn't think she came from Jalisco, and there's a lot of jokes about how oh, we Spanish can't pronounce Mexican names. Mm. Mm. We'll pass over that. Mm. Authoris is Jalisco nun. And with always African tiger, Camus is innocent beasts and humans. It was only when I had, so here's a humans picture to end on. I know that's not it. <laughs> they're two boys embracing, but they're not lovers. We want them to be lovers, but they're not. What are you doing, Manolo Cabo? <laughs> Here, the uh, exotic dancer in the Frankoist family. Ooh. And here's something you may not recognize. My good Mexican friends recognize this. My Mexican friend recognized this. And we'll talk later. So it's only when I'd almost finished this lecture that I discovered that Alejandro Spitza currently Mexico's most visible young actor, had begun his career in Rayito de Luz, <laughs> 2000. This is a free television adaptation of Marcelino Pan y Vina. So it, it all connects. Have I made my point? It all joins up. As you may know, in Marcelino Pan y Vina, which is like really gay, <laughs> an abandoned child in a kind of extremely creepy, bizarre way. An abandoned child is raised by monks in a monastery. So, the lengthy descent of Frankist films of priests and nuns, a genre once revered and now despised, has cast its shadow as far as Real del Monte, which is in the state of Hidalgo, a rural location as isolated as any in Camus or Caro. And this fresh-faced, innocent boy grew up to be a queer, curious, perhaps queer-baiting is the word, queer, curious, and fashion-forward young man with five million followers on Instagram. So you can see it. It was <laughs> this prayer to the good and feet that, that made it all happen. Uh, so if such much-loved telenovelas, like authorities' films, have been denied critical attention as unworthy, we should remember that popular cinema and television have existed only in a market economy. What are they to do? The supposed division between organic and mass-produced modes of the popular 
is untenable. Moreover, the Camus who strove for symbolic capital to make a dignified cinema was himself scorned by some critics even at the time, who read his good taste as timidity and his literary sens sensibility as a strategy for the suppression of more authentic comic genres, because supposedly costumbrismo is very Spanish. And of course, Almodovar's reputation has fluctuated wildly over times and territories. Yeah, as I say, read El Paises' review of his gay cowboy film, which is very hostile indeed. Foucault admonishes us to narrow focus, suggesting, I quote, an event is not a decision, a treaty, a reign, or a battle, but the reversal of a relationship of forces. The appropriation of a vocabulary turned against those who had once used it. End of quote. This last term, which he baptized much later, reverse discourse, it's an early essay, he doesn't use that term, is familiar to queer studies and indeed to queers who would take up that word as we had taken up homosexual before it and use it to contest our oppressors. As we have seen, it is a strategy shared by queer writers as diverse as Almodovar and Karen. Finally then, last paragraph, I promise, and in the light of the reverse discourse, a genealogy of Spanish cinema and television, such as I've sketched here, will testify to a final quote from Foucault, a knowledge that is not made for understanding, but for cutting. <coughs> that is, one that introduces productive discontinuities into the apparently smooth flow of media history. I am reminded once more and for the last time, of the showgirl Yolanda, who cuts her male partner out of the photo that she offers as a queer <coughs> gift of love to the mother superior, who is her most faithful fan. Thank you very much.